Good morning. My name is Craig Soul, and I've been honored by the family to uh, share a few things that I've learned about Laddie. But I even have a greater honor, and that is to be blessed by you, uh, being a close friend of Virginia, as well as Laddie, whom I love. A Scottish doctor delivered him, and when he handed him to his mother, he said, here is your wee Laddie. <laughs> and Laddie stuck his whole life. As you can see on the service sheet, his formal name was Woodrow Wilson Townsend. His grandfather thought the 28th president of the United States was one of the greatest. For entertainment, as a teenager, Laddie would sometimes bring a friend to his house to play canasta with the family. When he brought Virginia to his house, his grandfather told Laddie not to let her get away. <laughs> Laddie took her advice. I really don't know how Laddie would have gotten along without Virginia. He constantly sought her advice and knowledge. She was his encyclopedia. Virginia, what is his name? Virginia, what time do we need to go? Virginia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she always had the right answers. There was one exception. After he was retired, he was anxious to move to the Northern Neck. Although he was retired, Virginia wasn't. After raising six boys, she was enjoying her job at Sears, where she was quickly recognized as a top-notch salesperson in marketing Sears home services. Sears rewarded her with trips across country and promoted her to a teaching position. One day when, Laddie, when Virginia got home from work, she found an empty house. Laddie had run out of patience and packed up all the furniture and moved down here. He did leave her a mattress on the floor and her dresser drawers with her clothes in it were scattered throughout the bedroom. She took the hint and soon ret retired herself. <laughs> Laddie could have been a tobacco farmer. As a teenager, he spent summers helping his uncle harvest tobacco. Even though his uncle wanted Laddie to take over the farm, Laddie decided instead to become an apprentice in the air conditioning business. However, it didn't take long before he realized that this business was seasonal. He got a government job with the CIA, and eventually he worked nights in the CIA printing plant where he prepared the president's daily briefing. He knew what was going on in the world before the president did. It was important for Laddie to contribute to the community. At the age of 16, he became a charter member of the Brandywine Volunteer Fire Station and later in life, he spent 17 years as president of the Mid-County Volunteer Rescue Squad. Laddie loved this church family. Singing in the choir and getting involved in the planning of this new Light of Christ Anglican Church building. During the lengthy ordeal of getting it planned, he drew his own layout sketches and advocated for his improved ideas. I remember he wanted arched windows, and more recently he regularly contributed to the organ fund that he hoped would be purchased someday. Every spring he planted tomatoes, which he donated to the Light of Christ Anglican Women's Thrift Shop for resale to help raise money for the building fund. Laddie loved the Northern Neck. When the boys were younger, they would come down here and camp out on the beach. 
He also successfully dabbled in real estate. Buying and selling land was fun for him. More recently, he enjoyed investing in Myrtle Beach condominiums. He was a waterman, fishing and especially enjoying crabbing frequently with his brother, Buzz. Laddie was always easygoing and made a practice of meeting and greeting new people. That was one of the reasons he liked to go on ocean cruises. Virginia and he have enjoyed well over 20 cruises. They accumulated so much seniority with the cruise lines that they got special deals and would be invited to the captain's table and to his parties. He was especially grateful and proud of the way his family worked together. The annual fireworks display for the church members and neighbors is an example of the whole Townsend family joining together to celebrate the birth of our country. But even more importantly was the way the six boys coordinated their support when there was a special need. For the last few years, both Laddie and Virginia had frequent health problems. The boys worked together to support their parents and took very good care of them. I can't remember that Laddie did anything reluctantly. Whatever he got involved with was with strong feelings and a joyful heart. No matter the circumstances, Laddie remained easygoing. It was hard to ever find him disturbed. He loved life with our Lord Jesus and his devoted wife, Virginia. He enjoyed his close-knit family, six sons, daughters-in-law, 12 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. He loved life with a positive outlook, lived it to the fullest, and with passion. That he has been a blessing to me. He taught me not to take, not to take life so seriously, to relax more and accept the difficult times as well as the joy-filled times. I sure hope he's getting along all right in, in his heavenly body without Virginia. Laddie will always be with us. He's in our minds and will remain in our hearts. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Craig, if I didn't know better, I would think that you had a listening device in my house. <laughs> because much of what you said I was going to include too, which means you know Laddie very well. Well, I'm sure I'll repeat some of it. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Leah Townsend Jones, and I'm Laddie's baby brother, baby sister. <laughs> Not the brother part, no, just the baby sister part. And um, that relationship lasted for me 69 years, and for Laddie 81. I was always his baby sister. I've been chosen to say a few words about Laddie from the viewpoint of his younger siblings. There were five of us under Laddie. Um, looking at his pictures out there, you can see that he appeared to be a very happy, outgoing young boy with cutest dark curly hair. When he was about three, Sister Kitty was born, a new playmate for Laddie. They remained close until his death. Kitty recalls how she and Laddie, ages nine and 12, would sometimes be left at home for a few hours, putting Kitty, mom always putting Kitty in charge, even though she was three years younger than Laddie. As a side note, Kitty was always in charge. 
even later. To surprise mom, the two of them would make a chocolate or yellow cake from scratch, which is what you did back in those days. I know a lot of people remember the pre-cake mix days. According to Kitty, after the cake was done, no one was ever allowed to uh, lick the beaters or the bowl, but Laddie. He pulled rank as being the, I'm the oldest. As a teenager, Craig alluded to the fact that mom and dad allowed Laddie to invite his friends over for dance parties in the basement of our home in Brandywine, Maryland, next to 301. But he never failed to include his little sister. I remember a time reminding me that Laddie loved to dance. When we went to Aunt Madge's and Uncle George's, my mother's brother and sister-in-law who lived in Waldorf. They loved music and loved to dance and would have dance parties in their big family room. Someone put a record on the phonograph, and I know most of us remember what that was. Yes, a big, round, flat record, and soon the music rang out across the room. I couldn't have been more than five, maybe, Laddie 17. I can remember Laddie saying, come on, sunshine, which was his name for me when I was a little girl. Let's dance. And he put me up on his feet and started dancing me around the room until my feet fell off. And then he continued twirling me around the room, laughing all the time because my little old legs weren't, weren't any competition for his long legs. And so the, the harder it was for me, the more he laughed. Laddie was protective, as Kitty recalls. She tells of one snowy day, oh, a lot more snow than this, when she went sledding with Laddie and the twins, David and Glenn, down our back hill and across a creek to the farm next door. Kitty said she trusted Laddie's advice when he said to be sure to lay real flat when you go under the barbed wire fence. <laughs> he said, you can do it. She did it all right. Somehow she must not have fully followed that sage advice of our brother because she ended up with a bad cut and she swears that scar is still there on the back of her leg. You know, I bet you didn't know that Laddie was multi-talented. In his early years, he showed a propensity to play the piano by ear. Kitty tells me that for a couple of years, he even received piano lessons from an elderly woman named Mrs. Early. Laddie said this lady was very strict and would smack him on his knuckles if he messed up any of the notes. Now the three oldest boys, Laddie, David, and Glenn, shared the love of sports. David and Glenn played semi-professional soccer, while Laddie's strong point was baseball. He was a switch hitter and was selected to join a minor league affiliated with the old Washington, Res Washington Senators baseball team in Florida. At the last minute, he decided against doing that. And quite wisely, I must say, Virginia. By the time Laddie was 12, mom gave birth to a baby girl, me. I adored my big brother. He called me sunshine and showered me with brotherly attention. My fondest memory is sitting atop his shoulders as he tried to show me a falling star. I never saw that star, but I will never forget the feeling of being so high that I could almost touch the sky. I can still feel my then little fingers holding tightly onto his head, and I can still see him pointing to the sky. What a glorious memory that is for a three-year-old child and her 15-year-old brother. At about that same time, mom gave birth to some claim her last and greatest child, <laughs> Buzz. Buzz is a stinker. Now, you would think that this 15-year difference in age might 
have created somewhat of a distance between their relationship, but you would be wrong. Once grown, Laddie and Buzz shared many common interests, beginning with a volunteer fire department. In later years, they became best friends, living across the creek from one another. They fished and crabbed and went out to lunch and went to see Mary and took cruises together. Hardly a day went by that they didn't see one another. And on days or nights when a Washington baseball or football team was on TV, they burned up the airwaves, each with their own walkie-talkie. <laughs> In the relatively recent past, when Virginia stayed with Dan and Lisa following one of her surgeries, Kitty got to spend some quality brother-sister time at Laddie's house. Just the two of them again, and time seemed to stand still. Laddie and Kitty became kids again as if the past 70 years had evaporated. They had time to revisit their childhood memories. Kitty cooked with Laddie, and sometimes Laddie cooked for Kitty. They watched house hunters, fixer-uppers, DIY programs, and of course, sports. Such precious time for the both of them. I would like to switch gears at this time and read to you an autobiographical piece of um, written work by Laddie. Dad had included this passage and others in a genealogy book that he created. These are Laddie's very words. Highlights. As a child, things I remember. Uncle Chick would take me to Brown's Inn, stand me on a stool, and let me pull the handle on a penny slot machine. <laughs> the ball games in our backyard in Brandywine with cousin Sandra and the Walders. Our parrot, Polly, in a cage hanging in a tree calling for us to run, run, or you're out. <laughs> our first dog, Brownie, from our litter of wild dogs. The years spent with grandmother and granddaddy Townsend cutting their grass, bringing in their coal for the heater stove, and the card games before going to school. The walks to Jerry's store with granddaddy, the kids collected along the way. We was like the Pied Piper. We just kept collecting children. And then he would give each one of them money, a nickel, for candy. As a teen, the summers spent on the tobacco farm at Aunt Thelma's and Uncle Clyde's, working with cousins Phil, Laurie, and Russell, and after work, going to the river to fish and swim, playing soccer and baseball for Gwynn Park High School and the championships won. Best friends Bobby Gardner, Donnie Ellis, and the good times we had. The parties in our basement, especially the Halloween party when Dad rigged up a ghost to go from a the, a tree to the house. He scared us half to death. The teen club run by a friend, Mr. Durwood Highfill. This is where I met my wife-to-be, Virginia Ely. Joining the Brandywine Volunteer Fire Department as a junior member. As an adult, my baseball tryout with the old Washington Senators. My wedding day. October 20th, 1956. Then came the family. We were blessed with six boys over the years. Woodrow W. the third, Trip, Michael, Mike, Daniel, Dan, Kenneth, Scott, Douglas, Doug, and James, Jimmy. The family continued to grow as the boys married and now we have daughters-in-laws. As of this writing not being done yet, along are coming grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Church is an important part of my life. As a youngster, I served as an acolyte at the Chapel of the Incarnation. I spent 23 years as a Sunday school teacher. I served the Mother Church, St. Thomas Episcopal Parish, Croom, Maryland, of which the chapel is a branch, as both junior and senior wardens of the vestry. I also spent many years as co-chairman of the St. Thomas Parish famous Tobacco Barn Antique Show. 
which at the time of his writing, he said had operated for 38 years. Since we've moved permanently to Heathville, Virginia, I am now a member of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, am a vestry member and serve on the committee for two craft shows. Other activities include past president of the Brandywine Fire Department, president of the Mid-County Rescue Squad Auxiliary in Heathville, and chairman of the Ways and Means Committee for Northumberland County Public Library. My hobbies are hunting and fishing, making replicas of lighthouses into birdhouses and bird feeders, spending winters in a warmer climate, and shopping. In closing, I would like to say that the person I miss most is my mom. I thank the Lord for the two years that mom and I went to lunch and shopped almost every day. P.S. If I could live my life over, I know of no changes I would like to make. You have it all when you have a loving family. Truer words have never been said. Laddie loved Virginia with all her, his heart and wanted her beside him always, even when working on that special soil mixture he used for his tomatoes. Virginia can tell you she was his helper, or should I say gopher. Virginia, go get me this. Virginia! Whatever. Laddie and Virginia went on to raise six adorable little boys who grew up into six of the most amazing men I have ever known. Like all of us, he had his faults, but I choose to remember Laddie's childlike zest for life and his happiness. In one of our last, very last conversations, Laddie told me he was ready to go when it was his time. He said he had lived a good life. When he passed, at first I was in shock, with time, I know that I will learn to smile again when I think about Laddie. Right down, there's just a big hole in my heart. We were so very, very lucky to have Laddie for our brother. He was truly a gift from God, given to us through the grace of God. Our brother Buzz writes poetry for special family events. In this case, writing poetry helps Buzz handle his grief over losing his best friend, his brother. Buzz's poem is called Laddie. Laddie was a great brother, husband, father, and friend to many. When I think of enemies, he didn't have any. He was preceded in death by his father and mother and the loss of Glenn, a younger brother. He lived a blessed life and enjoyed it his way I know he will be missed by all every day. Laddie and I have done many things. He taught me to crab with chicken necks and wings and strings. Over the years, he was a big part of my life at the firehouse, and he was there when I married my wife. I enjoyed our talks when we would crab and fish. We talked about politics and condos and for what we wished. I will miss all the times we would go to lunch. There's an emptiness in my heart. I'll miss him a bunch. And now, Laddie, on this day, I have only this to say. You're in, now in heaven with Glenn, Mom, and Dad. Someday I will see you again and talk about the fun we had. Thank you. Hello, my name's Doug Townsend, also num num known as number five. This is my brother James, number six. <laughs> On behalf of my mother, Virginia, and five brothers, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Our father, Woodrow Wilson Townsend Jr., known to all as Laddie, was an amazing man. A patriarch arc of our large family, he was so loved by his wife, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Volu fire department volunteers, co-workers, and endless amounts of friends. Dad came from simple beginnings, born the oldest of six children. He was raised with discipline and love, 
got into the normal trouble, or really he excelled at trouble. He met his lovely, his love, my mom, in school. They quickly became a pair. This past October, they celebrated their 61st first wedding anniversary. They made their home in Brandywine, Maryland, and built their family home in 1966. The house was on a plot, family plot of land, and my brothers and I grew up surrounded by aunts, uncles, grandparents, and lots of woods. My dad was a hardworking man in his career, as well as buying land, dividing it up, and selling it off. Early on, he discovered the northern neck of Virginia, a peaceful spot for my parents, a boy's natural playground full of outdoor exploring and family time. My dad loved it here. Since it was tough and expensive to take six boys on family vacations, mom and dad bought their own vacation home here in Whitestone when I was about eight years old. Uh, the first years of having it, dad would get off at midnight. Mom would have all, us all packed up in the camper and we would head to the Northern Neck. It wasn't much, but we learned to fish and crab, and we had a rope swing that swung into the creek that kept us occupied. After that home, they bought the small cottage that is the site of their current house. The Northern Neck quickly became a popular place with family. After only a few years, dad's brothers, sisters, coworkers would follow him and later on, his sons would follow. Everyone always wanted to be close to my dad. All my life, I've known him as someone that everyone wanted to be around. He had that energy, that spark, the tr that tradition, that fun, that respect about him was contagious. He absolutely loved all his family getting together. He was the pillar of his family and community. Dad was the sole provider for our family, and although he made a good living, he was taking care of a family of eight. He and my mom had to make their money go further, and I can remember Dad, Uncle Buzz, and Uncle Mike would head to the police auctions in Brandywine. They would, they would sell rows of bikes, nice bikes, that had been stolen and nobody had claimed. I can remember walking down the rows of bikes, picking out the ones that I wanted. Such cool bikes. What kid wouldn't want one of those? Well, he didn't quite come home with those. After all those were sold, they would sell pallets of bike frames, tires, gears, and handlebars, and parts. He would snatch those up and bring them home. Never a full bike in those piles. We would ride Franken bikes that we put together ourselves. Now at that time, it may not have been the best, but it taught us a lot of mechanical skills that have been useful in our adult lives. Dad implanted a lot of other things on us boys, hunting, fishing, giving, hard work, love of family, church, and the fire department. We all got something from him, many things from him. Dan and I went into the fire department, Scott and Mike hunt and fish. James and Tripp both own houses here in the Northern Neck. We all learned the value of hard work. We all learned the value of family, and to this day, I think, it's, I, each of us still surrounds ourselves with family. One other thing we got was a sense of humor. It was impossible to do with, impossible not to do with six boys and seven if you count dad. <laughs> we have many stories that we can tell, but James is just gonna tell a few of them. First off, uh, Aunt Leah, your nickname was Sunshine. You got lucky. Mine was Scridgely Midget. <laughs> so I'm, of course, number six. Um, Dad loved lots of things in life. God, family, friends, church, this country. Um, he absolutely loved when all those things came together once a year for the 4th of July. Um, to set the record straight, 
mom always introduced Scott or myself as one of her two sons that did the fireworks. She should have been saying one of my three sons that did the fireworks and included dad in that because he was a third of it. Um, over the two plus decades that uh, Scott and I worked with dad on the fireworks, um, dad taught Scott and I many unusual life lessons. Never throw a worn out drill bit in the creek and brag about how far you threw it because it might actually be the brand new drill bit that you just bought. Always measure to make sure the fireworks will fit under the bed. Don't worry, they fit, and don't tell your mother. <laughs> when one of our fireworks props, the Orange Blossom Special Number 2, I won't tell you about number one, needed a headlight, we decided after much discussion to use Tupperware. <laughs> Dad's comment of, we'll put it back afterward, your mother will never know, was a well-intended thought, but it didn't pan out. Who had any idea that Tupperware was that flammable? <laughs> These are just a few of the funny things, life lessons that Scott and I experienced over the years, and there's many more that I, thankfully, uh, Mom, I won't go into. Um, but one of the things I'll surely miss the most is Dad telling these stories and making me laugh. Thank you. And one of the reasons we came here today was not just to remember, but to celebrate the life of Woodrow Wilson Townsend, or as you affectionately known as Laddie. I was going to tell the story, too, of how he got his name, but because I had never asked him. I, it wasn't until two weeks ago that I asked Virginia about where the name Laddie came from, and she told me about that. I love the, I love the story because it was indicative of the way he grew up with family, the closeness of family. And it's something he carried into his, old, his own family as well. One of the first things I learned about the Townsend, fa the Townsend family is that they were close-knit. And you couldn't be around Laddie and Virginia more than five minutes before you knew all about their six sons and their grandsons. He told me a lot of stories about how it was that the, he and Virginia met. I never heard the one, though, about him cleaning out the house and leaving her with a mattress. I, I guess you don't tell your priest that, do you? So, <laughs> so. The thing is, is, I used to go and visit them, and every time I did, it's, it was rare that, that some of the sons weren't there. And always somebody, maybe it was this Mark or other grandsons, but it was always the family member was always hanging around because they wanted to be together. I was treated to the story about how the jobs he had and, and how they met and how they had ended up coming to, down here from Brandywine. These stories were an important part of who he was and he wanted me to know about them. And I was honored. And you couldn't be around him very long before you knew about his love for the volunteer fire department and first responders in general. It was a passion of his. And when he, my first visit, he told me when I came back that he wanted to take me out on a boat. He wanted to take me crabbing. Now, I'm thinking when he says taking crabbing, I, I've only done it once, and it was with a string and chicken guts. But he was high tech. He had crab pots in a boat. So I came back later on, and he took me out with a couple of his sons, and we emptied some crab pots, and we took a bunch of crab, and we go back into the house. He had this great uh, steamer for, for crabs. He had special things he put on it. I don't know anything about it because I had never eaten crab before. I've eaten crab legs. I've eaten crab cakes, but I'd never had the whole thing before. And so we go back to the house, and he cooks up a bunch of crab, about 40, I think, and we sat down to eat crab. And the one thing that I found out, when it comes to eating crab, the Townsend family doesn't fool around. 
I mean, you can be a guest, but when it comes to crab, it's like you're, all, it's like you're on your own. <laughs> the thing is, is Laddie sat back. He knew I'd never popped the, the shell off a crab before, and so he sits back to watch me do it. And, and Virginia said to me, what, what you have to do is you have to rip off the face and tear out the lungs. <laughs> I'm thinking this sound like an awfully violent thing for such a sweet woman to, to say. But she showed me how to do it, and we got down to business. And that day, I had about six or seven crab. You know, sitting in their house with their family, you would have thought that I'd been a friend for years. That's who they were. I think that's how Laddie and Virginia treat everybody, and I love them for it. When he got sick, I would come and visit, and he would insist he was going to get better because he was a positive guy. I'm going to beat this. And I was hoping that he would. But you know what? It didn't take long also, to, knowing Laddie, that you, you found out about his love of God and his love of the, of the church. And I got to hear many stories about that too. I said at the beginning that we came here today to celebrate the life of Laddie Townsend. The reason we can is because a long time ago, Laddie made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, and he invited him to be both Savior and Lord, and it was a vital part of his life. And that's why we can celebrate today that Laddie has gone to be with his Savior that he surrendered to many years ago. Our epistle reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 gives us this, this hope that if we have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul writes, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are unseen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. You know, the fact is, Laddie's earthly body simply wore out. They always do. But now the promise of God is that on the last day, he's going to receive a new body, a body that will never again perish. We also have the promise we read this morning from Isaiah 25. That he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away every tear from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And from our gospel reading this morning from John 6, we, we, write, we read, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Our separation from loved ones who have died in the faith is temporary, providing we too have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're going to see them again, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain or suffering. The question here today, though, is are you a Christ follower? There's a fact that no one can dispute. Ten out of ten people die. doesn't matter whether you believe that or not. The fact of the matter, only time has to elapse to prove that's true. One person said that a man is made up, his life is made up of 20 years of his mother asking him where he's going. Or 50 years of his wife asking him where he's been. But then there's that, that one hour at his funeral where everyone is asking where he is now. The sobering fact before us today is that everyone here will one day be the one being mourned. And it will either be a celebration of life that is now lived, continued eternally in the presence of God, or the tragedy 
of a life now lived in eternal judgment. You know, sin and judgment are not a popular topic in our culture. And those who dare brook the subject are seen as unloving or narrow-minded bigots. But the truth is that not speaking of this truth of the Scriptures is the most unloving thing that I can think of. Because it's a matter of eternal life or eternal damnation. We live in a time and among people that, who have rejected God and they have no idea of a loving Creator. And because of that, they have no sense of hope or the truth and the meaning of the love of Christ found in the cross. Many are seeking to find the meaning of life and have concluded that life has no real meaning. It's just random and arbitrary. If you're a Christian, you must reveal that good news of Jesus Christ before it comes to this place. You must introduce those that you know, those that you love to, the, to your Savior. That must be your life's mission. Because he provides them with their true identity and the purpose for which they were created, which is to know God and to worship and enjoy him forever. The fact of the matter is that God through Christ offers us relationship with him. Here and now, that's why we were created. And the more we run away from that, the more we suffer the consequences of our sins. It leads to addictions. It leads to misery, dissatisfaction with life, and causes us to pursue things that, that look promising but when attained bring no relief. That was not true of Laddie Townsend. Laddie was able to live life to the fullest because he found what the real life was about. It was about relationship with his Creator. And he lived in the freedom of that. And the joy of that. And it made everything else come into focus. Proper focus. Only Jesus is able to meet the need of your heart. And we can only have Jesus when willing, we're willing to bow our wills to him. And in repentance, turn to him for our hope and salvation. Laddie came to believe that. And that's even how he, fo he faced pain and suffering. Of all the times that I visited with him when he was, he was very, very sick, I never saw that fear because it wasn't there. He wanted to live. He loved his wife. He loved his sons. But he did not fear death. Today we come to say goodbye to Laddie Townsend. He's gone on, but you're still here. Where will you spend eternity? Jesus is the only way to the Father. There are no other options. And that is why we can celebrate that Laddie Townsend has gone home to be with his Heavenly Father. And I'll tell you this, we miss him. But given the opportunity to come back, he wouldn't take it. Because what he knows now is the full realization of what we hope for. Let's pray. Lord God, we come today to thank you, to praise you, and to, Lord, and to re just revel in the fact that our brother is with you. And Lord, I know that, I know the joy he has is full and complete, a joy he's never known before, but he does now. I pray for this family. I pray for the friends who have gathered here today. I pray, Lord, that his example will be the motivation they have to follow you fully, to let nothing stand in the way. I pray your Holy Spirit's presence to be upon them. I pray for Virginia and for the sons and grandsons, for the brother and sister, that, Lord, you would give them peace and joy and the certainty that one day they'll be reunited again. In Jesus' name, amen.